You might be an amateur photographer printing family photos or travel photos to your 4x6 printer, or a professional photographer or creative artist who really depends on accurate color. I'm your host, Brent Haley from Left Hand Man Productions, and today we're going to give a color update. What's happening in the world of color? Everything from file formats, what should you use, JPEG or RAW, screen calibration, what are the, some of the new calibrators that are out on the market? We have a guest from X-Rite slash Graytag, the newly merged company. We're going to talk to them about what's happening there and some of their new products. We're going to look at some of the applications that are currently out on the market. Aperture, Lightroom, which just got announced, what they're doing and how to get accurate color through that workflow. And a guest from HP talking about their brand new line of printers for professional photographers, the Z series. Now the first thing that we want to start talking about is inputting your color. Now that could either be from a scanner, a camera, or something you create on screen. And that's the first step. Now most of the time that is a photo. And we're bringing it in from a camera these days. Almost all of us have a digital camera. And it's very important to start working with that. So let's go over to the Creative Studio and take a look at some of the new things about file imports and color profiles. The first thing we want to talk about is color input. And that's usually rotating around your images. All of us are working really with a digital camera and that could be either this HP PhotoSmart camera, 7 megapixels, really nice camera, or if you want to go a step up and do like this Canon SLR D60. It doesn't really matter. What's important when you talk about color is what's happening with that image when you take it. Some of the cameras that are out there are actually applying a color profile to them. And you just want to be aware of what's happening with that image when you do it. Let's take a look at some of the color profiles that are out there and what's happening in color. I'm going to open up the Color Sync Utility and show a few new profiles. Now Adobe RGB 1998 has been around for a long time and it's very well known inside the photography community. Now there's another profile that's out there, the Pro Photo RGB. And why does this matter? Well, when we're working with images that we might want to print on a very large printer, say the HP Z2100 that's behind me, you want to capture the most color that you can when you import your photos. You don't want to transform. Every time you transform, you lose color. So to give you an idea, I'm going to hold this one for comparison. And let's compare it to our Adobe 1998. Well, you'll notice a lot bigger color space. So if you are dealing with images where you need that color space, you want to know which kind of profile that you're actually going to apply to it. Now the other part of importing images is dealing with formats. Now there's two formats out there that are really well known. One, JPEG. Everybody understands that. It's what most cameras use. Now there's another one that a lot of people talk about in the pro photography space called RAW. Kind of confusing, but it's exactly what it sounds like. It's RAW. It's ones and zeros. It's digital. Nothing's been done to that image, even color. So when you take that image and you bring it from your camera, nothing's been applied to it. To give you an idea, I'm going to open up a few images that I took, same camera, just different settings. Now you notice inside of the Mac OS X, I have the icons would say RAW and JPEG. Now I can open up a RAW format right inside a preview. Mac OS X can see all of these file formats, RAW, JPEG, you don't have to have another application. So you don't have to install software from a camera manufacturer or anybody else. You can do it directly inside a preview. It's really cool. And you can just start working with these images right away. Now we've talked a little about the file formats and the profiles, but what happens when you just plug that camera into your computer and you're downloading it? Now you have some options. You could go directly to iPhoto, you go to a program like Aperture or maybe Lightroom, but there's some cool stuff you can do even before you go to those applications. Now, we're all digital and we're taking a lot of shots. Might be taking like I do, you know, my one-year-old, 50, 60 shots in the park in the afternoon. That's a lot of images to start dealing with. So for me, I like to use image capture. If we look at the preference pane, 
you see that I, when a camera is connected, and that's any kind of medium, memory card, compact flash, it opens with image capture. Not another application, say Aperture or iPhoto. I actually like to use image capture. And there's a few reasons for that. Let's plug in memory card. And it's gonna bring up this memory card and say that I have 42 images that I can download to the desktop. I can do an automated task. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the options area is really cool. I can actually embed a color sync profile right from image capture. So for example, I'm setting and shooting a lot of raw images, and I decide that I want to embed ProPhoto RGB in each one of those images when I download. So I have control over these images. It's not camera RGB or sRGB. I'm getting and applying the most color space that I can right off the bat. Now another thing is this automatic task. Now you notice that below the line here, I have all the presets that are usually in here, crop to four by six, five by seven, so on and so on. But there's another one in here and there's a little automator icon next to it. It's called copyright to iPhoto. I actually built that automated task. Let me show you how. Now if you haven't used automator, you should really investigate looking at this application. Look at all the things that I can control. Everything from address book, to mail, to preview, to Safari, to Spotlight. And it's super easy. It's a scripting engine. So I'm going to go into Spotlight, and I'm just gonna add Spotlight comments. It's as easy as dragging and dropping it right onto the workflow. And I'm gonna say copyright, Brent Haley. So every single photo that I have is going to add that copyright material because of course we have lots of photos. We don't want to do this by hand. It's too cumbersome. I can do other things. For example, if I wanted to go into preview, say I want to do a sign, a color sync profile. Maybe I don't want to do it through automator tasks. Maybe I want to have multiple tasks with different profiles so I can easily pick which ones I want to use. And I'm just going to add in the Pro Photo RGB one right here also. Now, it doesn't mean that I can't keep going with my automation like I usually do and maybe drag in iPhoto. And let's import these photos into iPhoto. It tells me to choose an album, or maybe I want to do a brand new album every time I open this. And that's my automator script. Now, once I'm done with all of my workflow, I can save this as a plugin, and this is where Automator is really cool. I can access Automator scripts all over the place. In the Finder, on the desktop, maybe an iCal Alarm, Image Capture, which we'll talk about, Print or Script Menu. So really flexible, and again, I can only show you a short demo of this, but if you're interested, I really recommend you check out a full demo of Automator. I'm gonna save this as Image Capture. Let's call this Copyright and iPhoto two just so we know which one we're doing and let's save it hide automator we do have to quit image capture for this to take effect and let's go back over to image capture and open it up now you notice that if i go to automator task i now have that brand new automation task that i can select so now i'm going to select it and maybe let's download a few so we don't stay here for a long time. And I'm just gonna select a few of these and download them. What it's gonna do now is download it, add a copyright in the Spotlight Finder information, change all of those raw images and add a color profile, and open it up in iPhoto. So just like I would usually do by plugging in a card and going to iPhoto, but now I've added in a few steps and added a lot more information into those photos and it's all automatic. And as you can see here, now I have all my photos inside iPhoto and an album of my little boy Quinn, all with a copyright information and a brand new ProPhoto RGB profile. Now before we go any further, we really need to stop and talk about screen calibration. I'm sitting here with Liz Quinless from X-Rite. Liz, thanks for taking the time to be here with me today. I really appreciate it. Hi, Brent. It's good to be here. Well, of course, the first thing I'll ask you is, you know, X-Rite, what, what do you do at X-Rite? Actually, I work in the imaging and media category for X-Rite, 
and I work as director of marketing for our strategy and it really is a little bit different. I came from the Great Hunt Best side of the business. As you know, we had a merger last year. We'll talk about that soon. And really what I do is I work together with partners to make sure that our product lines are aligned in the marketplace, that we're connecting for our current customer bases, that we actually have the solutions that touch the creative space, pre-press, press room, packaging, all those places where color becomes important. Now, you kind of mentioned it, and that's one of my first questions. You came from Grey Tag Macbeth, and a huge merger just happened. Uh, Grey Tag Macbeth and x two of the huge companies in color in the industry. Um, why did that go through? Why did that happen? Well, it's kind of interesting, and also probably just as surprising for both companies at the time when it was announced, because we were definitely competitors in many areas, although it was interesting that in some areas we weren't competitors. For instance, x was very well known in the press room, whereas Greytag was very much prevalent in the imaging business, right? Mm -hmm. And then also geographically, we're balanced a little bit. Greytag was more focused in Europe, X-Ray a little bit more in US, both about equal in the Asia community. So combining these two companies together really helps us put together the leverage of combined R&D resources, talent, services, and being able to go out into the market to bring new products together. So with the product line, I mean, you guys had some competing products and some not. How's the product line shaping up and what is that going to look like in the next year for us? Okay, so we definitely had some redundancies in the product line. And we did put together a team to integrate these product lines and to look at it very much from a hard base fact. And, you know, the really interesting part is that from a technology standpoint, performance standpoint, these products really were about equal. And so that was not the most deciding factor as why we left something in the product line or why we took something out. Other factors such as brand recognition, install base, and technologies of where we wanted to go, platforms we wanted to build upon. So for the creative space, the i1 brand clearly made some sense for us. And we are using this technology also in our other products. So we're building automated products that have the i1 technology inside, like the i1 ISIS. And we also work with other partners too like in the Design Jet Z, this is i1 technology that's inside. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, and we have uh, Greg from HP on later, but uh, the, you know, the, and that, that comes just talking about partners, which is really, to me, the first time I've ever seen a color company, uh, a printer company, really start talking about solutions. This comes with the Z Series 2100, and it actually is HP branded, but powered by Gray Tag Macbeth. Now, obviously, I assume that's going to change that a little bit. That will change, yeah. And have X right <laughs> yeah, there uh, exactly. pretty soon. But this is just like the i1 display. Correct. And same technology? It actually is the exact same thing. It's just because we, as a partner, want to provide the, all the solutions so that they can deliver to their customers closed loop color management. So this is i1 display 2 technology, same correlation as what you see with the X-Ray brand on it. Awesome. I, you know, I, one of the most fantastic things is, you know, just trying to build solutions for color, which I think is one of our, you know, major points that we're making here today, too, is really talking about solutions, not individual products. Now, there's another product that I want to talk about, and that's uh, mostly working with people who are, you know, taking photos and, and want screen calibration, uh, the first step. And this is with a company that a lot of us are familiar with, the, the color guides, Pantone. Uh, talk a little bit about this and why, why this came about. Oh, actually, Huey's a great little product. Um, it really is unique. It's got its own unique form factor there. It doesn't look like the other monitor calibrations we've seen before. And one of the things that it actually does is it actually takes an ambient light on the fly. So as your light changes in your room, and especially if you're not working in a really controlled lighting situation, which usually the pros would do yeah. with the higher end solutions. But, you know, if you're looking at this and it's price point $89, does a great monitor calibration. And the way that the interface was written was really meant for those that don't want to know anything technical about color management. Very simple terms, very simple user interface to walk through. So the first step, I mean, you're making color achievable for everyone. I mean, I can now get something, you know, $89 and put this on my screen and uh, edit photos at night, edit photos of the day and automatically Absolutely. it changes my screen so that I can get the same color across the whole time? Absolutely. I mean, it's really meant to let's move downstream, let's let's give color to the people that are not want to spend a lot of money and they can get going and get good color on their screen. 
Sounds like the X-Rite Grey Tag uh, Macbeth merger really has paid off for you guys. What can we see down the road? We're, we're in 2007. Where are we going with some new technologies? And give us a little insight. Well, I mean, I think you can see uh, clearly from the HP partnership that we have that things are going to start moving a little bit more under the hood. Um, we've always had this vision that we really want to bring color to pretty much everyone, but put it in sort of a one push button situation or not see it at all. Now, we're not quite there. And for sure, this is just the very beginning, but this is where we're going. And to move, have color so that there's ways that they can access it easily, inexpensively, not complicated. Those are the big goals ahead of us. So not as expensive and definitely definitely easier to start achieving color. Absolutely. So everybody and, can do it. And working with the partners so that it's more integrated. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Uh, and uh, we'll be talking soon, I'm sure, on color. Great. Thanks, Brent. Thanks, Liz. And before we move on, I want to go ahead and review some of the products we talked about for screen calibration and profiling. The first one, the Huey, which is brand new, from x rite and co-branded with Pantone allows you to really easily calibrate your monitor. And at $89, a fantastic way to start working a color workflow. Now the next product is the i1 display. That allows you not only to calibrate a single monitor, but if you're in a small work group, you can calibrate all of your monitors so that every monitor looks the same and you have consistency across your whole group. Now the next product is the i1 Pro. This is a more advanced product and it allows us not only to calibrate our monitor but everything else in our workflow including our scanners, cameras and printers. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the Huey and how it works. Let's take a look at the new calibrator from Pantone and X-Rite called the Huey. Great form factor, probably the smallest screen calibrator I've ever seen. Well, first thing is start off with the software after I have it plugged in. And remember that this is a screen calibrator only. And it tells me to place the sensor directly on the display as shown. And it's got little suction cups on it. So it works on a flat panel LCD. And now it's going to measure each one of the color squares and calibrate the display. Now, not only can I calibrate my cinema display, I can also calibrate my MacBook Pro. 15 or 17 inch. So not only can you be portable, you can also be color accurate. The software is done and the calibration was successful. So I'm going to take off the Huey and put it back in its stand. And now I can see that I have uncorrected and corrected. Now let's go to next. I can set this for any different kind of contrast, gaming. I'm going to go graphic design. Now Here's one of the things that's different about the Huey, and it really is the x rite technology doing this. It allows me to actually adjust for lighting changes inside of my office. This is an ambient light meter built directly into the calibrator, and that's why it has a little stand on your desk. And I'm going to tell it to do this. If I go up to the top, I can turn off or adjust for the room lighting now. So in the morning, bright, maybe in the evening a little bit darker, it's actually going to take a measurement for me in the room and adjust my screen for me on the fly and do ambient light correction. Fantastic tool for $89. The most important thing you can do in a color workflow is to calibrate your screen and now it's easy and affordable. Not only does x rite make the technology that's inside the Huey, they also have their other products like the i1 Pro. Now, this is a professional model, priced about $249, but it allows you to do a lot more. We can calibrate our screen, projector, scanner, printer, or even camera. And it does have a better accuracy of calibration. So now that we've talked about calibration and working with our screens and we're all set, let's go to the next step and talk about printing from our applications and setting up all of our high-end printers. So I'd like to introduce our next guest, which is uh, Greg Richterek from HP. Greg, thanks for taking the time and being on the show. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Brent. It's a pleasure to be here as well. 
So first thing I like to you know always do to our viewers is kind of give them an idea of you know, what you do at HP. That's a great question. Um, I'm part of one of the companies at HP called Imaging and Printing. My job in this group is to work with those software partners that influence people to buy our product. People like Apple, Adobe, Autodesk, ESRI. They're all part. They they, they all do their role in influencing their customer base to uh, pursue HP as as their printer of choice. Well, it sounds like an awesome job. It really is. It's a lot of fun. I meet a lot of different people, um, and I learn a lot. You know, it's, uh, it encompasses many different marketplaces, which makes it very interesting for me. I'm not focused or pigeonholed in just one area. Now, today we came to talk really about a new product that HP has. It's the new Z series, correct. and that's the 2100 and the 3100, correct? Correct. And that was pretty in recently introduced? Yeah, it was uh, just introduced this, um, this last fall. Uh, it was in the September time frame. Um, we had a basically a hole in our product offering for the creative space. And we had uh, the DesignJet 5500 at the high end. Uh, this is a machine that can go up to 60 inches long, wow. six colors. And then at the low end, we had the DesignJet 130 and 90, which were more tabletop models and nothing in between. So we had to create uh, a series of printers at the right price point for this marketplace. You know, small graphic arts firms, you know, they can't, they can't afford a $10,000 highly productive printer. They need something in between. And that's why we came, came out with the Z-Series. Now you have two, two printers. Now the, the 2100, correct me if I'm wrong, is around the three and a half thousand, and then, then the 3100 is about four to five thousand. Correct. Which is, which is a very reasonable price for, for a printer with this capability. Now, there's two printers. Give me a quick breakdown of the difference between sure. those two printers. Sure. Um, the 2100, the Z2100 is an 8 ink printer. Okay. All right. Um, and the uh, 3100 is a 12 ink printer. And they're basically positioned in two different marketplaces within the creative space. The 8 ink printer is pretty much focusing on that individual graphic artist or that small firm, people doing posters, uh, banners, uh, you know, marketing collateral, things of that nature, and also the proofing marketplace. The 12 ink printer, because of the 12 inks, has a much uh, larger color gamut than the 8 ink printer. And that's specifically targeted toward digital fine arts, you know, reproduction, and the professional photographer. Professional photographer. Yeah, the 12, the 12 ink printer actually has four blacks. It has a matte black, a photo black, a medium gray, and a light gray. Wow. So with those grays, plus a gloss enhancer, and I'll talk about that in a second, with those grays and that gloss enhancer, um, you're, you're seeing uh, digital photography reproduction rivaling film. And in some cases, some, some of our photo influ influencers have given up on film altogether and are purely digital. Now, Jerry from Santa Fe Labs, which has been using this printer, and I sat down at Macworld and we talked about that gloss and handers, and he, and he was really impressed with that. And tell me why that's, that's cool for the photographer. It's really important. If you look at a, a real black and white photograph and you put it up to the light and you curve it, you'll see a nice continuous tone over the, the entire um, photograph. That's because of the paper and the chemistry involved in, 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 in the emulsion in creating the actual photograph. So there's always this kind of like glossy tone to it, kind of like a coating. If, um, when you look at a printer, uh, something, uh, an image that's printed off a printer, wherever there's white space, there's no ink put down, right? Yeah, it's an exactly. absence of color. Exactly. And if you put up a, a black and white digital reproduced photograph without a gloss enhancer, you're going to see those flat spots wherever there's no ink. So the gloss enhancer is actually used to create a continuous tone over the entire image. Very critical for pro professional photography. And I'm sure very critical for people who are doing, you know, fine art photography and things that are actually selling to their end user or actually selling maybe in a gallery. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's critical to DFA as well. Awesome. Now, now that we're on kind of the ink subject, the Vivera inks, um, suppose, first time HP's really come up with this archival ink set, I mean, 200 year yeah, archival ink exactly, set, exactly. And fantastic. And, and how are you guys, give me an idea of what's going on with that ink set. Well, you know, the thing is we wanted to, um, you know, get a brand going around our inks. What's, what's really critical with any printer manufacturer is you'll find you're going to get your best quality using that manufacturer's media both ink and paper. And we have, um, in San Diego, we do a lot of our ink development. We have over 5,000 biochemists that, that develop and engineer and invent our ink and our paper. It's really phenomenal. Wow. So to get the best quality, you've got to use the HP ink on the HP media. And 
we decided it was time to brand that ink. Okay. You know, call it something, distinguish it. And um, the first set of Vivera inks were dye-based, um, which is as opposed to pigment. And the dye-based inks are rated at 100 years archival quality. You'll okay. find those Vivera inks running in the uh, Design Jet 5500, the 130, and the 90. So what's currently in the marketplace right now? Correct. I mean, that, that, that is really a stronghold in the creative arts market, Correct. photography market yep, right yep. now. So with the introduction of the Z series, now uh, as I mentioned before, these are pigment-based inks. Um, pigment again gives us a, a larger color gamut than dye, um, and at the same time, it gives us a higher archival quality, as you said, 200 years. Now, the big joke is when you're on the trade show or talking to customers, it's really fun. Well, I'm not going to be around to see it, right? But the fact of the matter is archival quality is very, very important to, you mentioned it, museums, yeah, yeah, exactly. the government. Van Goghs you know, are still around, right? Exactly, you know, they're, exactly. They're, it's they're, very, they're. very important. Um, so it's imp more important to them than us being around seeing that photograph 200 years from now. So the other nice thing about the pigment inks, too, is that they're very highly water resistant. Now, we can't come out and call it waterproof, but um, we have a little demo in our booth that when we go to the photographic trade shows, it's a fountain that's continuously pouring on a four by six photograph and it hasn't faded yet. So they're, they're pretty water fast. Now you mentioned a four by six. Now, currently we're in the large format with these inks. Now, we have a four by six printer and other printers that also have these ink sets. There's one other um, pigment based printer that we've released at the same time. It's called the B9180. It's part of the PhotoSmart family. Uh, different division, but this is where we dovetail together. Yeah. A B size being um, 13 by 17. Gotcha. And uh, that uses the pigment based inks. And um, it is also that same archival quality. You can run four by six um, paper through that. Paper through that and make that happen. Exactly. So it's nice. I mean, you know, that's, I think, when I was working with uh, the 2100 that you guys uh, let me use for a while, um, I really like saying that I had the ink set from other printers. And as I can progress from, you know, a smaller size all the way up to a larger size, because as a designer, I can proof it, sign it off of my client. I'm not using a large sheet and, uh, you know, that's costly, you know. And, and so um, for these larger printers, and I know a lot of people think of, of course, their great price range mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. printer itself, but you got to think about cost of paper and cost right. of ink. Correct. Correct. Um, cost of uh, paper and ink is, is always an issue. You're always asked that question. But one key th factor about these printers that helps you save money, and which means won't, you don't waste time or space or you make bad prints, is because of the onboard spectrophotometer. Yeah. So you've got this instant one button color calibration control built into the printer. No other manufacturer has that. And that guarantees exact quality from print to print and from printer to printer. So that's a big cost savings right now because you're not wasting paper trying to get the print right. right? Yeah, and it was awesome for me because actually, and we'll look at this a little bit later when we do our demo, but I mean, even in my print driver, it told me I wasn't calibrated to that actual Correct. paper. And it was going to say, yeah, you need to recalibrate to that paper right on the fly, right from the print driver. Exactly. Which is one of the things I really like about HP yep. printers is yep. the ability to give me a little bit more feedback on what I'm doing, you know, because I want to, you know, I want to be creative. Sure. I don't want to go out and try and be technical on the printer. Exactly, exactly. Now, talking a little bit about paper, um, you guys have an enormous amount of paper, it's different stocks, I should say. Everything from, you know, the photo gloss to the photo satin, which is one of my favorites, Correct. Um, all the way to now, canvas? Yeah, we, um, this is a little bit out of date, but this is um, an example of a swatch book we hand out at trade shows. And this just gives you an idea. The pages in here are very, very thin, you know, the different media. And you can see, wow. you know, it's really, really thin. So there's a lot of media represented in here. And like you say, we range all the way from the, the fine art type of media. You mentioned canvas. Uh, this is what Kincaid uses for yeah. his reproduction. Oh, okay. um, you've got the photo satin, which is a very nice media. You have watercolor paper. Huh. You've got other kinds of canvas that mimic different centuries. Um, all the way to simple coated bond for the for the architect that just needs to bang out a line drawing. So, um, you know, we usually have just about everything you need. We also have outdoor banner um, scrim and vinyl and things of that nature. So the pigment inks on the vinyl you can put up outside, it's not going to fade for a very long time. So we've got the media that fits just about every need. You asked me earlier about cost. And that cost can range from anywhere from two or three cents to 50 cents a square foot, again, depending on the, the media and the yeah, application. And so, yeah. um, for example, if you were to 
print a two by three poster, uh, almost full bleed, let's say 99% coverage, that's going to run you about, and let's say it's on nice paper, let's say yeah. it's on a nice coated bond that you're going to put up in the store window for a while, that might cost you 30, 35 cents a square foot, hmm. you know, a couple, yeah. three, four bucks to, to actu actually do the print. You take that to a service bureau, they're going to charge you $50. Oh, exactly. So, exactly. you know, these printers, depending on your productivity, can really amortize themselves in a very short time. And then all of a sudden, the cost for the ink and, and the media really becomes a non-issue. Well, it seems like you guys are filling a fantastic, like you said, a gap that needed to be filled with these. Uh, got great ink. You know, archival, fantastic paper choice, cost of the printer, which, you know, when I first saw the cost, was amazed with. Um, anything else that you wanted to add of, you know, differentiation that HP's done with these printers other than, say, some other unnamed competitors? Well, I think specifically we've touched on that. The pigment-based inks, going to 12 color, uh, we're the only one in the large format that has the gloss enhancer and the only one in, in the industry that has the onboard spectrophotometer. Um, that, that technology is developed and delivered by X-Ray Corporation, and you combine that with the, uh, the monitor display calibrator that they have, we finally have a very easy closed-loop color calibration system. And I think that's a, that's a first in the industry. And, and, you know, that's what we're talking about today is color and how do we, you know, help people make it a little bit easier, you know, know that they can attain good color and actually start working with it. Absolutely. Well, Greg, fantastic to have you here on the show. I really appreciate your time and, and, and all your great expertise on these printers. Thank you, Hopefully we'll uh, have more and more people be looking at them and good prints coming out in good color. Sounds good to me. Take care. Thank you very much. Well, that was fantastic. And one of the great things, again, is working with HP in color. It's a closed solution. We have, you know, spectrophotometers where we're doing on screen. They're partnering with the right people like x right and really working to provide customers with a solution, not just a printer, but a solution, something that includes inks, paper, color spectrophotometer and color accuracy, all for a really, really great price. Now let's take a moment and talk about setting up our printers. Ranging anywhere from maybe a 4x6 printer all the way up to maybe the Z series which I have behind me which is a 24 inch wide roll printer. Now inside of Mac OS X, I can go into System Preferences and select my Print and Fax area. And I can add in a printer. Now you notice inside of my printer browser, it's brought up a single printer on Bonjour. Now, Bonjour is the technology in Mac OS X which automatically senses printers. Now, this is great because one thing about HP printers is they're automatically aware on the network. You take an Ethernet cable to any HP printer, plug it in, it'll come up on Bonjour, it'll also assign itself an IP address on the fly. So, really easy to find printers. Now, I'm going to add in this Z Series 2100. And you'll notice that I can select the HP DesignJet driver. Now there's two kinds of printers out there. There's a raster printer and a postscript printer. If you're using a postscript printer, you can select any one of the drivers that are installed and located inside of the OS. And this is working with anything like Quark Express, InDesign, Illustrator, anything using fonts or actually drawn postscript art. Scale it, work with it in a PDF, works great. If you're working with photos and have a raster printer, like the Z series behind me, you really want to go ahead and download their drivers because they have a lot of technology built in that gives you the best print for that. And I would also recommend downloading the latest drivers from their website. They might have boxed this printer up, put it on the shelf and sent it to you. It might have been a while since they've actually installed or updated these drivers. So make sure you have the latest stuff for your OS and for your applications. Once I've selected the driver that I want to use, let's select that design jet. Let's show one more feature, which is called sharing. Now, as I mentioned, the HP printers can be used via IP or plugged directly into your network or your router. They can also be used by USB. Now, if you're using a USB printer, it's great to turn on sharing because then Everybody in your network can see that printer. You don't have to have an IP printer. You can do this using the OS. So now I can have everyone in my work group see that design jet through access of my computer. Now, of course, if I turn my computer off, it goes away, but a great feature to share that printer with your whole work group. 
Now that we've set up our printer drivers, let me show you an example of how these work and let's actually print something out. Well, I'm going to use preview and another image. And the first thing I'm going to do is to go into page setup. And make sure that your page setup is set up for that actual printer. Now, the DesignJet Z21 has a lot of different sizes. I'm going to go to the 24 by 36 size and then say OK. And now my page setup is done. And I'm going to go ahead and say print. Now, you'll notice inside of my print dialog box, it gives me my image. And it doesn't give me a lot of information. Now, this is a little weird with OS 10, but when I click the advanced feature, it actually gets rid of the preview, but it is giving me more information. Now, I can pull down and talk about paper handling, what document paper sizes I want to work with, color sync, which is very important because that's color, and we're just going to do a standard conversion. But here's the important part, and this is where HP really shines on their driver technology. They've actually added in some new functionality in their latest drivers for their latest printers. Now you notice that I can see the paper, which seems interesting, but you'll look here down at the bottom. It's telling me right now that on this Z2100 that I'm not set up correctly. I'm looking at a photo gloss, but I actually have a photo satin paper that I've loaded into the printer. And I've put that into the printer, and the driver looks at the printer and talks to it constantly. So now, go into paper type, tell the one that I want, and that device status goes away. So giving me some really great information. Now if I select the color tab, there's another area which is great with HP drivers. I can either select printer manage colors, and a lot of printers out there do some really tweaky things with color. They will make it brighter, make it bluer, because they want to make the best print they can. Now, as people dealing with color, we've done everything we want to do, right? We attached the right profile when we brought in the camera. We went in the applications and used the right profiles as we went through all of our applications. And now when we're printing, we want to use that same technology and use the application managed colors use either the Pro Photo RGB or the app Adobe RGB profiles. So now their drivers allow us to turn all of that technology built into the printer off and just have the application or in this case the OS manage those colors for us. Fantastic way to just go ahead and print that file out. So now I can just say print and out comes this file. A lot of us are used to the workflow of having an image, bringing it into Photoshop, and then maybe dropping it into InDesign or Quark Express. Now there's some other applications that have been introduced lately. Aperture from Apple and Lightroom from Adobe, which we have to consider in our color workflow. Now we've taken these images, we've imported them, we have the correct profile assigned to them. Now how do we integrate these applications because these are applications that allow us to organize our photos, allow us to take those 50 digital shots that we did and refine it down to maybe one or two and then maybe we might want to go to Photoshop and do all the work there and then drop it into our workflow. So let's start with Aperture. I've just brought up some canoe images that we've been working on. Notice I have one here. Now this is a raw image and remember what I said about raw images is that there hasn't been any color information applied to it yet. So if I look inside of Aperture, everything that happens around color happens on the export. So I'm going to bring up File and Export a Version. And you'll notice that I have an export preset of JPEG original size. Well, let's go into the Edit area and see what that actually means. Now, if I say JPEG original size, you'll notice that the color sync profile or the default color sync profile is sRGB. Now we talked about other profiles, Adobe 1998 or Profoto RGB. And if we're going to a large printer, like we talked about with the Z21 or 3100, we want to make sure we keep that same color space. So we might want to change this. And it's pretty easy. Go to Photo RGB. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and say plus first and Go JPEG Pro Photo RGB export. 
change that color sync profile, and then say OK. Now I have an export preset which has the correct color sync profile that I want to work with. Now when I export this, drag it into Photoshop, I'm not making any color transforms. I'm keeping in the same consistent color workflow that I've done before by going from import into Photoshop. But now I'm using another tool like Aperture to allow me to organize and work with my photos. So last but not least, we want to talk about printing from Photoshop, an application that probably all of us use for printing images. Now, first thing we want to do, of course, with printing from Photoshop is go into Page Setup, just like I do in all of my other applications, Preview, InDesign, Quark Express, and make sure that I have the right printer selected, the DesignJet Z2100, and the page size that we're doing, which is the 24 by 36 roll. Once I've said OK, go into Print with Preview, and now I can select all of my color handling. I'm going to let Photoshop determine the colors because, again, I've kept a consistent workflow, same color profile, and working with this on the same image across every application. Importing, maybe we're using Aperture or Lightroom, and then going into Photoshop. And now the printer profile, I can select a printer profile that I'm working with. Again, you notice that I have all of the different papers that are located or available to that design jet. And I'm going to pick the dry photo satin that I'm working with. And once I select print, up comes the print dialog box. Now this seems a little bit weird, but again we're talking about going from Photoshop and accessing the HP raster driver, which we install. I'm going to go down to paper handling, make sure that I've got the right document paper size again, and then go to paper type and quality. Now again, with the HP drivers, you can select the correct paper. Now you'll notice that it's also said you don't have the right paper. This driver is actually talking to the printer. I selected the wrong one in the print with preview, and it would have been totally messed up. So now it's telling me that I want to select the photo semi-gloss, satin paper, instead. Well, let's go and select that, and my constraints and device status goes away. I'm ready to go. Now selecting on the color tab, you'll also notice that it says application managed colors. Just like when we selected preview and it dealt with the OS dealing with it, the application Photoshop is going to do my color management for me and send it down to the printer. So the printer isn't doing adjustments or anything. We have full control of the final print. So working with the DesignJet series printer, any of the applications that you want to work with, either preview in the OS, Lightroom, Aperture, or Photoshop, and working with the raster driver from HP gives you the best control and the best quality of your prints. Well, that's an update on color. For more information and solutions for the creative arts market, visit us at lefthandman.com.